Chapter Twenty Four of She and Alan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. She and Alan by H. Ryder Haggard. Chapter Twenty Four. Umslopogas wears the great medicine. A little while later we started, some of us in litters, including the wounded Zulus, who I insisted should be carried for a day or two, and some on foot. Enos I caused to be borne immediately in front of myself, so that I could keep an eye upon her. Moreover, I put her in the especial charge of Hans, to whom, fortunately, she took a great fancy at once, perhaps because she remembered subconsciously that she knew him, and that he had been kind to her. Although, when they met after her long sleep, as in my own case, she did not recognize him in the least. Soon, however, they were again the fastest of friends, so much that within a day or two the little hottentot practically filled the place of a maid to her attending to her every want and looking after her exactly as a nurse does after a child with the result that it was quite touching to see how she came to depend upon him her monkey as she called him and how fond he grew of her once, indeed, there was trouble, since, hearing a noise, I came up to find Hans bristling with fury and threatening to shoot one of the Zulus, who, stupidly or perhaps rudely, had knocked against the litter of Enis and nearly turned it over. For the rest, the Lady Sad Eyes, as they called her, had for the time became Lady Glad Eyes, since she was merry as the day was long laughing and singing and playing just as a healthy happy child should do only once did i see her wretched and weep it was when a kitten which she had insisted on bringing with her sprang out of the litter and vanished into some bush where it could not be found even when she was soon counselled and dried her tears when hans explained to her in a mixture of bad english and worse portuguese that it had only run away because it wished to get back to its mother which it loved and that it was cruel to separate it from its mother we made good progress and by the evening of the first day were over the crest of the cliff or volcano lip that encircles the great plain of kor and descending rapidly to a shelter spot on the outer slope where our camp was to be set for the night not very far from this place, as I think I have mentioned, stood, and I suppose still stands, a very curious pinnacle of rock, which doubtless being of some harder sort had remained, when hundreds of thousands or millions of years before, the surrounding lava had been washed or had corroded away. This rock pillar was perhaps fifty feet high, and as smooth as though it had been worked by man. Indeed, I remembered having remarked to Hans or Umslopogas, I forget which, when we passed it on our inward journey, that there was a column which no monkey could climb. As we went by it for the second time, the sun had already disappeared behind the western cliff, but a fierce ray from its sinking orb struck upon a storm cloud that hung over us, and thence was reflected in a glow of angry light of which the focus or centre seemed to fall upon the summit of this strange and obelisk-like pinnacle of rock. At the moment I was out of my litter, and walking with Umslopogas at the end of the line, to make sure that no one straggled in the oncoming darkness. When we had passed the column by some forty or fifty yards, something caused Umslopogas to turn and look back, he uttered an exclamation which made me follow his example, with the result that I saw a very wonderful thing. For there, on the point of the pillar, like St. Simeon's delightus, on his famous column, 
glowing in the sunset rays as though she were on fire, stood Asha herself. It was a strange and in a way a glorious sight, for poised thus between earth and heaven, she looked like some glowing angel rather than a woman, standing as she seemed to do upon the darkness, since the shadows, save for the faintest outline, had swallowed up the column that supported her. Moreover, in the intense rich light that was focused on her, we could see every detail of her form and face, for she was unveiled, and even her large and tender eyes which gazed upwards emptily. At the moment they seemed very tender, yes, and the little gold studs that glittered on her sandals and the shine of the snake girdle she wore about her waist. We stared and stared till I said inconsequently, Learn, Umslopogas, what a liar is that old Bilali, who told me that she who commands had departed from Kor to her own place. Perhaps this rock edge is her own place, if she be there at all, Makumasan. If she be there, I answered angrily, for my nerves were at once thrilled and torn. Speak not empty words, Umslopogas, for where else can she be when we see her with our eyes? Who am I that I should know the ways of witches, who, like the winds, are able to go and come as they will? Can a woman run up a wall of rock like a lizard, Makumasan? Doubtless and I began some explanation which I have gotten, when a passing cloud, or I know not what, cut off the light, so that both the pinnacle and she who stood on it became invisible. A minute later it returned for a little while, and there was the point of the needle-shaped rock, but it was empty, as, save for the birds that rested on it, it had been since the beginning of the world. Then Umslopogas and I shook our heads, and pursued our way in silence. This was the last that I saw of the glorious Asha, if indeed I did see her, and not her ghost. Yet it is true that for all the first part of the journey, till we were through the great swamp in fact, from time to time I was conscious, or imagined that I was conscious of her presence. Moreover, once others saw her, or someone who might have been her. It happened thus. We were in the centre of the great swamp, and the trained guides who were leading came to a place where the path forked and were uncertain which road to take. Finally they fixed on the right-hand path and were preparing to follow it together with those who bore the litter of Enos by the side of which Hans was walking as usual. At this moment, as Hans told me, the guides went down upon their faces, and he saw standing in front of them a white-veiled form who pointed to the left-hand path, and then seemed to be lost in the mist. Without a word the guides rose and followed this left-hand path. Hans stopped the litter till I came up, when he told me what had happened while Enos also began to chatter in her childish fashion about a white lady. I had the curiosity to walk a little way along the right-hand path which they were about to take. Only a few yards further on I found myself sinking in a floating quagmire, from which I extricated myself with much difficulty, but just in time, for, as I discovered afterwards by probing with a pole, the water beneath the matted reeds was deep. That night I questioned the guides upon the subject, but without result, for they pretended to have seen nothing, and not to understand what I meant. Of neither of these incidents have I any explanation to offer, except that once contracted it is as difficult to be rid of the habit of hallucinations as of any other. It is not necessary that I should give all the details of our long homeward journey, 
so I will only say that having dismissed our bearers and escorts when we reached higher ground beyond the horrible swamp, keeping one litter for Ines, in which the Zulus carried her when she was tired, we accomplished it in complete safety, and having crossed the Zambesi, at last one evening reached the house called Stratmyr. Here we found the wagon and oxen quite safe, and were welcomed rapturously by my Zulu driver and the forlooper, who had made up their minds that we were dead, and were thinking of trekking homewards. Here also Tommaso greeted us, though I think that, like the Zulus, he was astonished at our safe return, and indeed not over-pleased to see us. I told him that Captain Robertson had been killed in a fight in which we had rescued his daughter from the cannibals who had carried her off, information which I cautioned him to keep to himself, but nothing else that I could help. Also I warned the Zulus through Umslopogas and Goroko that no mention was to be made of our adventures, either then or afterwards since if these were done the curse of the white queen would fall on them and bring them to disaster and death i added that the name of this queen and everything that was connected with her or her doings must be locked up in their own hearts it must be like the name of dead kings not to be spoken nor indeed did they ever speak it or tell the story of our search because they were too much afraid both of Asha, whom they believed to be the greatest of all witches, and of the acts of their captain Umslopogas. Ines went to bed that night without seeming to recognize her old home, to all appearance just a mindless child, as she had been ever since she awoke from her trance at Kor. Next morning, however, Hans came to tell me that she was changed, and that she wished to speak with me. I went wondering to find her in the sitting-room, dressed in European clothes which she had taken from where she kept them, and once more a reasoning woman. "'Mr. Quatermain,' she said, "'I suppose that I must have been ill, for the last thing I remember is going to sleep on the night after you started for the hippopotamus hunt. Where is my father? Did any harm come to him while he was hunting? Alas, I answered, lying boldly, for I feared lest the truth should take away her mind again. It did. He was trampled upon by a hippopotamus bull, which charged him and killed, and we were obliged to bury him where he died. She bowed her head for a while, and muttered some prayer for his soul, then looked at me keenly and said, I do not think you are telling me everything, Mr. Quatermain, but something seems to say that this is because it is not well that I should learn everything. No, I answered. You have been ill and out of your mind for quite a long while. Something gave you a shock. I think that you learned of your father's death which you have now forgotten, and were overcome with the news. Please trust to me, and believe that, if I keep anything back from you, it is because I think it best to do so for the present. I trust and believe, she answered. Now please leave me, but tell me first where are those women and their children? After your father died they went away, I replied, lying once more. She looked at me again but made no comment. Then I left her. How much Ines ever learnt of the true story of her adventures I do not know to this hour, though my opinion is that it was but little. To begin with, everyone, including Tommaso, was threatened with the direst consequences if he said a word to her on the subject. Moreover, in her way she was a wise woman, one who knew when it was best not to ask questions. She was aware that she had suffered from a fit of aberration or madness, and that during this time her father had died, and certain peculiar things had happened. 
There she was content to leave the business and she never again spoke to me upon the subject. Of this I was very glad, and how on earth could I have explained to her about Asha's prophecies as to her lapse into childishness and subsequent return to a normal state? when she reached her home, seeing that I did not understand them myself. Once, indeed, she did inquire what had become of Jenny, to which I answered that she had died during her sickness. It was another lie, at any rate by implication, but I hold that there are occasions when it is righteous to lie. At least these particular falsehoods have never troubled my conscience. Here I may as well finish the story of Inez, that is, as far as I can. As I have shown, the, she was always a woman of melancholy and religious temperament, qualities that seemed to grow upon her after her return to health. Certainly the religion did, for continually she was engaged in prayer, a development with which heredity may have had something to do since after he became a reformed character and grew unsettled in his mind, her father followed the same road. On our return to civilization, as it chanced, one of the first persons with whom she came in contact was a very earnest and excellent old priest of her own faith. The end of this intimacy was much what might have been expected. Very soon Inez determined to renounce the world, which I think never had any great attractions for her, and entered a sisterhood of an extremely strict order in Natal, where, added to her many merits, her considerable possessions made her very welcome indeed. Once in after years I saw her again, when she expected before long to become the mother superior of her convent. I found her very cheerful, and she told me that her happiness was complete. Even then she did not ask me the true story of what had happened to her during that period when her mind was a blank. She said that she knew something had happened, but that, as she no longer felt any curiosity about earthly things, she did not wish to know the details. Again I rejoiced, for how could I tell the true tale? and expect to be believed, even by the most confiding and simple-minded nun. To return to more immediate events. When we had been at Stratmer for a day or two, and I thought that her mind was clear enough to judge of affairs, I told Inez that I must journey on to Natal, and asked her what she wished to do. Without a moment's hesitation, she replied that she desired to come with me, as, now that her father was dead, nothing would induce her to continue to live at Stratmer, without friends or, indeed, the consolations of religion. Then she showed me a secret hiding-place, cunningly devised in a sort of cellar, under the sitting-room floor where her father was accustomed to keep the spirits of which he consumed so great a quantity. In this hole beneath some bricks we discovered a large sum in gold stored away, which Robertson had always told his daughter she would find there, in the event of anything happening to him. With the money were his will and securities, also certain mementos of his youth and some love letters, together with a prayer-book that his mother had given him. These valuables, of which no one knew the existence except herself, we removed and then made our preparations for departure. They were simple. Such articles of value as we could carry were packed into the wagon, and the best of the cattle we drew with us. The place with the store and the rest of the stock were handed over to Tommaso on a half-profit agreement under arrangement that he should remit the shares of Inez twice a year to a bank on the coast, where her father had an account. Whether or not he ever did this I am unable to say, but as no one wished to stop at Stratmer, I could conceive no better plan, 
because purchasers of property in that district did not exist. As we trekked away one fine morning, I asked Inez whether she was sorry to leave the place. No, she replied with energy. My life here has been a hell, and I never wish to see it again. Now it was after this, on the northern borders of Sululand, that Sikali's great medicine, as Hans called it, really played its chief part. For without it I think that we should have been killed, every one of us. I do not propose to set out the business in detail. It is too long and intricate. Suffice it to say, therefore, that it had to do with the plots of Umslopogas against Setivayo, which had been betrayed by his wife Monasi and her lover Lusta, both of whom I have mentioned earlier in this record. The result was that a watch for him was kept on all the frontiers, because it was guessed that sooner or later he would return to Sululand. Also it had become known that he was travelling in my company. So it came about that when my approach was reported by spies, a company was gathered under the command of a man connected with the royal house, and by it we were surrounded. Before attacking, however, this captain sent men to me with the message that with me the king had no quarrel, although I was travelling in doubtful company, and that if I would deliver over to him Umslopogas, chief of the people of the Axe, and his followers, I might go whither I wished unharmed, taking my goods with me. Otherwise we should be attacked at once and killed every one of us since it was not desired that any witnesses should be left of what happened to Umslopogas. Having delivered this ultimatum, and declined any argument as to its terms, the messengers retired, saying that they would return for my answer within half an hour. When they were out of hearing, Umslopogas, who had listened to their words in grim silence, turned and spoke in such fashion as might have been expected of him. Makumasan, he said, now I come to the end of an unlucky journey, though mayhap it is not so evil as it seems. Since I, who went out to seek the dead, but to be filled by John the White Witch with the meat of mocking shadows, I am about to find the dead in the only way in which they can be found, namely by becoming of their number. It seems that this is the case with all of us, Umslopogas. Not so, Makumasan. That child of the king will give you safe conduct. It is I and mine whose blood he seeks as he has the right to do, since it is true that I would have raised rebellion against the king, I who wearied of my petty lot, and knew that by blood his place was mine. In this quarrel you have no share, though you, whose heart is as white as your skin, are not minded to desert me. Moreover, even if you wish to fight, there is one in the wagon yonder whose life is not yours to give. The lady's sad eyes is as a child in your arms, and her you must bear to safety. Now this argument was so unanswerable that I did not know what to say, so I only asked what he meant to do as escape was impossible, seeing that we were surrounded on every side. Make a glorious end, Makumasan, he said with a smile. I will go out with those who cling to me, that is, with all who remain of my men, since my fate must be theirs, and stand back to back on yonder mound 
and there wait till these dogs of the king come up against us. Watch a while, Macmazan, and see how Umslopogaas, bearer of the axe, and the warriors of the axe can fight and die. Now I was silent, for I knew not what to say. There we all stood silent, while minute by minute I watched the shadow creeping forwards towards a mark that the head messenger had made with his spear upon the ground. For he had said that when he touched that mark he would return for his answer. In this rather dreadful silence I heard a dry little cough, which I knew came from the throat of Hans, and to be his method of indicating that he had a remark to make. "'What is it?' I asked with irritation, for it was annoying to see him seated there on the ground fanning himself with the remains of a hat and staring vacantly at the sky. "'Nothing, Baas, or rather only this, Baas. Those hyenas of Zulus are even more afraid of the great medicine than were the cannibals up north since the maker of it is nearer to them baas you remember baas they knelt to it as it were when we were going out of zululand well what of it now that we are going into zululand i inquired sharply do you want me to show it to them no baas what is the use seeing that they are ready to let you pass also the lady sad eyes and me and the cattle with the driver and forelooper which is better still and all the other goods so what have you to gain by showing them the medicine but perchance if it were on the neck of umslopogaas and he showed it to them and brought it to their minds that those who touch him who is in the shadow of sikali's great medicine or aught that is his die within three moons in this way or in that well baas who knows and again he coughed dryly and stared up at the sky I translated what Hans had said in Dutch to Umslopogaas, who remarked indifferently, This little yellow man is well named Light in Darkness. At least the plan can be tried. If it fails, there is always time to die. So, thinking that this was an occasion on which I might properly do so, for the first time I took off the talisman which I had worn for so long, and Umslopogaas put it over his head and hid it beneath his blanket. A little while later the messengers returned, and this time the captain himself came with them, as he said to greet me, for I knew him slightly, and once we had dealt together about some cattle. After a friendly chat, he turned to the matter of Slopogas, explaining the case at some length. I said that I quite understood his position, but that it was a very awkward thing to interfere with a man who was the actual wearer of the great medicine of Sikali itself. When the captain heard this, his eyes almost started out of his head. Oh, the great medicine of the opener of roads! he exclaimed oh now i understand why this chief of the people of the axe is unconquerable such a wizard that no one is able to kill him yes i replied and you remember do you not that he who offends the great medicine or offers violence to him who wears it dies horribly within three moons he and his household and all those with him i have heard it he said with a sickly smile, and now you are about to learn whether the tale is true, I added cheerfully. Then he asked to see Umslopogaas alone. 
I did not overhear their conversation, but the end of it was that Umslopogaas came and said in a loud voice that no one could miss a single word, that as resistance was useless and he did not wish me, his friend, to be involved in any trouble, together with his men he had agreed to accompany this king's captain to the royal kraal, where he had been guaranteed a fair trial as to certain false charges which had been brought against him. He added that the king's captain had sworn upon the great medicine of the opener of roads to give him safe conduct and attempt no mischief against him, which, as was well known throughout the land, was an oath that could not be broken by any one who wished to continue to look upon the sun. I asked the captain if these things were so, also speaking in a loud voice. He replied yes, since his orders were to take Umslopogaas alive if he might. He was only to kill him if he would not come. Afterwards, while pretending to give him certain articles out of the wagon, I had a few private words with Umslopogaas, who told me that the arrangement was that he should be allowed to escape at night with his people. Be sure of this, Makumasan, he said, that if I do not escape, neither with that captain since i walk at his side and keep my axe and at the first sign of treachery the axe will enter the house of that thick head of his and make friends with a brain inside makumasan he added we have made a strange journey together and seen such things as i did not think the world had to show also i have fought and killed rezu in a mad battle of ghosts and men which alone was worth all the trouble of the journey now it has come to an end as everything must and we part but as i believe not for always I do not think that I shall die on this journey with a captain, though I do think that others will die at the end of it, he added grimly, a saying which at the time I did not understand. It comes into my heart, Makmasan, that in yonder land of witches and wizards the spirit of prophecy got caught in my mocha and crept into my bowels. Now that spirit tells me that we shall meet again in the after years and stand together in a great fray which will be our last, as I believe that the white witch said. Or perhaps the spirit lives in Sikali's medicine, which has gone down my throat and comes out of it in words i cannot say but i pray that it is a true spirit since although you are white and i am black and you are small and i am big and you are gentle and cunning whereas i am fierce and as open as the blade of my own axe yet i love you as well Makumasan as though we were born of the same mother and had been brought up in the same kraal. Now that captain waits and grows doubtful of our talk. So farewell. I will return the great medicine to Tsikali if I live, and if I die he must send one of the ghosts that serve him to fetch it from among my bones. Farewell to you also, yellow man. He went on to Hans, who had appeared, hovering about like a dog that is doubtful of its welcome. Well are you named Light in Darkness, and glad am I to have met you, who have learnt from you how a snake moves and strikes, and how a jackal thinks and avoids the snare. Yes. Farewell, for the spirit within me does not tell me that you and I shall meet again. 
Then he lifted the great axe and gave me a formal salute, naming me chief and father, great chief and father from old. Baba, Kosi Umkol, Kosi Pagate, thereby acknowledging my superiority over him, a thing that he had never done before. And as he did, so did Goroko and the other Zulus, adding to their salute many titles of praise. In another minute he had gone with the king's captain, to whose side I noted he clung lovingly, his long, thin fingers playing about the horn-handle of the axe that was named Inkosikas and Groan-Maker. "'I'm glad we have seen the last of him and his axe, Baas remarked Hans, spitting reflectively. "'It is very well to sleep in the same hut with a tame lion sometimes, but after you have done so for many moons, you begin to wonder when you will wake up at night to find him pulling the blankets off you and combing your hair with his claws.' yes i am very glad that this half-tame lion is gone since sometimes i have thought that i should be obliged to poison it that we might sleep in peace you know he called me a snake baas and poison is a snake's only spear shall i tell the boys to inspan the oxen baas I think the further we get from that king's captain and his men, the more comfortably shall we travel, especially now, when we no longer have the great medicine to protect us. You suggested giving it to him, Hans, I said. Yes, Baas. I had rather that Umslopogas went away with the great medicine then that you kept the great medicine and he stopped with us here never travel with a traitor baas at any rate in the land of the king whom he wishes to kill kings are very selfish people baas and do not like being killed especially by someone who wants to sit upon their stool and to take the royal salute no one gives the royal salute to a dead king, Baas, however great he was before he died, and no one thinks the worse of a king who was a traitor before he became a king. End of chapter 24 of She and Alan by H. Ryder Haggard Read by Lars Rolander